different Zoom lady. I'm the account owner. Oh, whatever, seems fine. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I'm jo I'm your host, as always, Jesse Collings. And joining me today is a returning guest. He's one of our favorite Canadian guests. It's I have talked about this before that like being a top Canadian guest on this show is a very competitive um, uh, contest to see who that can be. And getting a real opportunity here to get a leg up on everyone is Mr. Warren Hayes of the Warren Hayes Show. Warren, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Jesse, for having me. Uh, it is indeed competitive. I had to uh, I had to best uh, Griffin Peltier uh, for, for for the spot uh, as uh, 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 today. Uh, like it's always uh, it's always very competitive. What am I? I, I think this is a three peep for me, right? This is uh, this is my third appearance. If I'm not mistaken, it's at least the third one, if not right? the fourth. If not the, I, I do feel like a proper gentleman now. I, like I feel like I, at this stage here, I you know. I think it, it it will be difficult to uh, to challenge how much of a gentle man I am now moving forward. I feel I'm going to get really fancy, like the guy on your 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 uh, show art. Yes, <laughs> a great a great piece of artwork developed by Jeremy Sexton. I don't think he gets a, enough credit for that because he did a great job creating our, our logo when we switched over to the Voices of Wrestling Network. It's funny about the name because I. The name I kind of just have, you know, tossed out without like an enormous amount of thought into it. But it's very funny, like when I, when I, uh, you know, when guests come on or, or when I go on other shows, like I was on the NWA, the Nubian Wrestling uh, uh, podcast last week or two weeks ago. And they're like, we're going to get gentlemanly. Look, gentlemen, like they were like really into the gentleman aspect. And it's funny that people think about that because I, I, I to me, it's just like, a, it's just the name of my show, but other people seem to really get a kick out of it, which is, funny. I get a kick out of it. It was especially, and I know lyric and um, I'm sorry, her, her name is, is escaping me the, that you had on your show two weeks mm -hmm. ago, a couple of weeks ago. Right. Danny. They had the same. Yeah, yeah exactly. They were like, they, they brought it up too. And I was like, yeah, exactly. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, gentle, a, gentle woman doesn't sound right to me. No, like there's got to be a better, like I guess you would say, like ladies, ladies and gentlemen. But lady sounds informal. Like yeah, um, I've thought about that. I thought about how gender inclusive is my is my name and the name for the show. And the answer is not really. Um, but it's a state of mind, right? It's more it's more that than anything else. It's not necessarily a thing about gender. It's more like. Where are you in your in in your thought process in regards to pro wrestling? How are you able to discuss it? Can you discuss it like a gentleman or like a Twitter bottom dweller? Right, right. That's essentially correct, Warren. That's exactly the the point of the show, which is like the reason it's called that is because like when I was creating it with Jason Unpresser, we wanted it to be like not uh, a bunch of hot takes. Like we're gonna mm -hmm. take an issue and we're gonna discuss it in as intelligent of a way as we possibly can, and we're not gonna be focused on like you said, like, like bottom feeding Twitter bot nonsense. Um, and that you're right. That is the, that is the point of the show, which is a good transition to the topic of today's show, which is really just taking a, a big picture look at all of the wrestling as we record this podcast on Friday, May 31st. I think it's probably not going to go up until next week. Like I'm, I, I like the idea of rolling out the podcast on like a Monday, um, as opposed to, I think like Friday or Saturday is not optimum for people's schedules. Um, but obviously Monday is, and I think that AEW is at a really interesting and important place, I think in the minds of a lot of people. Um, and I'll, I'll start with this. I think the last six months to a year. AEW has been a much more frustrating promotion than it was prior to that time period. And I think there are a lot of different interpretations about what direction the company is going in. And I wanted to talk about this in the really big picture because I feel like so much with All Elite Wrestling, the discussion is based around what just happened, what happened on last night's episode of television, what happened at the last pay-per-view, what happened, you know, last week. And it, it, it kind of, that leads to a lot of change and discussion and people, I think, 
giving a lot of time and thought into things that maybe are not that important in the long run. But I think if we take a step back or several steps back and look at the big picture of like where this company is headed from a business perspective, where it's headed from a creative perspective, where it's headed from just an overall what the product is like perspective. I would say that there is a lot of different types of frustrations that are emerging from fans. And I would say that in general, the business metrics are, I don't want to say concerning, but they could be better, I think is a fair term. I think the television ratings have, have fallen down a little bit. The 18 to 49 rating um, has not been great. There have been some you know, pretty middling attendance numbers for a lot of shows, especially TV tapings. Um, so there's some, like I said, concern is, 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 is a term I really want to stay away from, right? Because like the, 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 the trolling and the, the, oh, is AEW in trouble? I, I don't think AEW is in trouble. And I'm not concerned about the business metrics, like spelling doom for AEW. But I am interested in trying to discuss and figure out maybe why some of these things are down over the last six months to a year and what could possibly be done to fix them. But I'll ask you, Warren, as, as I like to think of you, Warren, as a very positive minded individual. Oh, OK. Thank you. I like to think that you are, you know, you're really you're often focused on the good of pro wrestling, which I like to think of myself as as well as like I'm going to focus on the things that I like and not try to complain so much about the things that I don't like. Um, especially in terms of a, a, of a company like AEW, which has largely given me tremendous enjoyment over the last five years. But what are your kind of just, you know, big picture perceptions of the company over the last year? And kind of have they changed from where they were maybe in like 2021, 2022? I, I, I think there's, my, my thought process meets up quite a bit to where you are right now. Uh, I think that, uh, um I, I I thought last year for for the at least from spring moving on, I thought that the that uh, that AEW was in a very strange place. Thought we were far far away from far removed from what uh, not only uh, what we had been promised. I know a lot of us go back to that, you know, to the you know when Tony Khan and Cody were were you know running the gauntlet and doing the 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 uh the grassroots um press conferences and talking about sports based presentation and how we wouldn't do interviews in the back and so all that stuff you know I know we go back to that a lot but you know when you're promised something and then you get it taken away you know then you can ask why it's been taken away I think but yeah I, I the, uh, so on that front I think um so yeah it, it's changed from what we were promised, but also from what we were indeed given. You know, there were, there have been a lot of changes at, after AEW was launched in regards to what was promised, but it always maintained a, I, I feel a, 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 a very solid foundation, nonetheless, of even though we're not like a pure sports based presentation, you know, it's not like New Japan in America kind of thing, even though it's not like that. There's still the a very solid foundation, which lasted for a good amount of time. Where you could, this was a promotion that you could rely on to have great matches every week, right? You, not just good, great matches every week. You'd you'd, you'd have the, the you'd have these long strips of time, uh, week after week. Because you know, I myself do a, a an AW Dynamite review show uh, on, on my end of things every week. And I remember there was a period of time where I would be screaming into, shouting with glee, that's better, into my microphone, how spoiled we were week after week to just have such tremendous, great matches. Like, and, and then you'd have, you'd have these, these kick-ass promos from some of the best in the business all grouped together and just delivering incredible mic work on top of that. And and for some reason, things started to pivot, and uh, I really feel like it. Like we had, if we let's say we talk about a year, so we go back to spring twenty twenty three, and I don't know. I f I feel like I'm going a little all over the place here, uh, Jesse. Real corral me back if if uh, <laughs> if I'm getting too scattered well, here. Well, can I ask? Like you you. 
do you feel like the the product what you talked about like the week to week television, seeing the matches, seeing good promos. Do you feel like that isn't happening anymore on AEW television? Do you feel like the quality of what we're talking about? Like, I think like the peak quality of stuff where you would see, or at least the consistency of seeing something that's extremely high quality, not the whole show being uh, super high quality, not great segment, great segment, great segment, great segment, great segment, but more like, oh, each episode at least has one, you know, notebook match or, or, or a really memorable promo. You feel like the shows do not have that at the same consistency that they want at the did? same at the same consistency. No, they don't. They they, they mm -hmm. really don't. And I think it's a peak and valley kind of thing. Like, I think. And, and it's really weird, right, because I, I, I for the past two years, I've noticed this pattern where you know, in 2023 and in 2024 this year, we cut, we start the year and things are tremendous. Like AEW has this pattern of starting off the years really, really strong and going into revolution and everyone is excited. And then revolution at least for the past two years has been, uh, you know, extraordinary show 20 revolution, 2024. I, you know, I personally would qualify it as legendary. It's, it's it was a tremendous show from top to bottom. And we, and 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 the buildup is great, and everything feels good around the product. And then spring comes along, and then somehow there's 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 a shift. We don't exactly it, it, we we don't focus on the same things as as much. It, things get things shift into a mode that doesn't resemble AEW. Last year we had MJF and the Brochachos that started to simmer. And then went full blown over the summer. Nowadays we have, you know, the uh, we've got uh, the 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 um, the the young bucks doing the uh, evil authority figure stuff, stuff, you know, and you know, and, and and these are angles that take up a lot of space on the show. So, like, I I I see. So, but this this is despite the fact that. Leading into Revolution, things were going great. The Continental Classic last fall was tremendous. Like the Tony Khan came, you know, asked us to put our money where our mouth is, and we did, and it delivered, and it was tremendous. Like I had a great time right up until Dynasty this year. I, you know, I felt the show was in an upswing, uh, but for some reason, I like, like I said. Again, the, we're we're getting into the spring, and stuff feels off. We get reports that Tony Khan is a little scattered. Last year, we were blaming the upfronts. We were blaming this, you know, CM Punk being CM Punk. You know, this year, oh, now we're talking about the media deal. Like, is it cyclical, Jesse? Is is, is there something like in the spring air that just you know? that 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 causes tony to lose focus well like I, the I pet theory is that like he gets really into the nfl draft given his position with the jaguars of course and and so like when it's like nfl draft season which would be like from super bowl from the super bowl up until late april he's extra distracted um i don't know if i believe that but we have seen wrestling companies be um kind of uh Cyclical, no, right? Cyclical, based on their kind of annual calendars. I think most people would say like WWE post WrestleMania up until SummerSlam is usually quite dull. And then like from Survivor Series until like the end of the year is usually quite dull by WWE standards because of they kind of build up to these bigger events. And then there's kind of a, a lull period naturally after that. With, with New Japan, it, it's usually pretty boring unless you're really into the real world tag league from, you know, that... Post G1. Yeah, well, like the, they have like, you know, King of Pro Wrestling or whatever that used to be, whatever that's called now. And they have like whatever the November show is called now, which I forget. Um, but they have like, you know, that that that's that that few month stretch where it's kind of like, all right, just waiting for Wrestle Kingdom to happen. Um, so we do we do see that in other wrestling promotions. It doesn't seem like there's anything in particular on the calendar of AEW because they don't build up to gigantic annual shows. Although you could argue the Wembley show will eventually become that, but there's no real tradition there. So it's kind of hard to identify. Really, there seems no reason for like the springtime to be a lull in, in AEW's creative. 
And it seems what you're saying, you know, which I think is is pretty fair. It's not like AEW is is isn't trying to build up to something. Like it's kind of obvious. Like with WWE, it's like they don't want to give away any of their really big matches on some of these B pay per view shows, the Saudi Arabia show or whatever. So they're gonna kind of be in a somewhat holding pattern until we get to SummerSlam or New Japan. They've kind of got the Wrestle Kingdom card locked into place a few months out, so they're kind of in a holding pattern. AEW doesn't have that. What seems to be happening, as you're describing, is just like a loss of creative focus and kind of, I think, what is is the biggest talking point when people talk about AEW is identity. And what does your product mean? And what does your brand name mean to fans? What does that guarantee when they turn on your show or they buy a ticket? And I think for the first few years, it meant great matches and great promos like you were describing there was a real consistency to the week-to-week product and now there's a sense from fans that um that's not the case that you don't really know what you're going to get you might get a bad show you might get a good show you might get a great show um but without that consistency and kind of different types of personalities emerging the more sports entertainment style angles and storylines is kind of clashing with what people originally thought of was the identity of AEW. Um, yes, and I, I and I concur with that. I agree. And you know the consistency. You you know I want to be sure I'm clear. You know, there, like I said, there there was a stretch where you know, like I said, every week, week after week, you'd have top to bottom just in, impeccable shows. Uh, you know, every Wednesday night, and that's not necessarily. You know what? I'm not necessarily looking for a Brian Danielson five star match every Wednesday, or you know, a Hangman Adam Page having a stellar match with anyone like a, you know, same thing. I'm not looking for just top to bottom four and a half to five star matches every week. I, it's not reasonable, and I don't think it's a sp- sustainable as a business model either. Um, but but I am looking for that excitement. Look, I am looking for elements that make it feel special. And I think that's what it's lost quite a bit because I, I think there's multiple reasons, you know, for that. I don't think there's one thing in particular. I think 2023 was a very difficult year for AEW as far as its identity goes, as far as its, uh, uh, uh it, you know uh, it's front facing identity but i feel even like its own corporate identity i, I you know i, I shudder at get it, saying it that way but you know it's its own its own branding if you prefer you know with, within itself um yeah and- i think there's a number of different things that are going on I, for me personally i i kind of even though I totally understand what you're saying when it comes to that, there's not that level of consistency on a week to week basis with, with dynamite or or collision anymore. I still struggle to really see, to get that, you know, rankled by um, maybe a slightly less uh, good product, because I still think even like a, you know, a dynamite that would be considered one of the lesser dynamites is still to me significantly better than like 99% of all weekly wrestling shows that we've had aired in this country. I just, I still think that even AW at a lower standard is significantly better than anything WWE is producing on a weekly basis. Um, and so in, in, in really historically what we've been given as wrestling fans, is it, are we getting four and a half star matches every week? no, but we're still getting a much higher quality in-ring product than I think there's ever been presented on weekly television. Um, So I'm still like kind of in the phase where it's like, I'm just really grateful to have this wrestling product that I'm enthusiastic about, even if it's not quite at the level that it once was. Um, Now, that being said, you mentioned something about like the identity and perception. And I'm of the belief if we're looking at the big picture thing here, I think the entire CM Punk situation from, um, you know, the really from the, the workers rights promo and that reaction 
onward has been uh, a real detriment to AEW and the company is still hasn't recovered from the perception and chaos that situation was caused, even though both sides have moved on in a lot of ways and that um, no one's wondering when CM Punk is going to come back and there's no like power struggle within AEW between CM Punk and, and, and his enemies there. Um, even though we've kind of moved on past that, I still think the company, you know, I think CM Punk in kind of the way that situation ended up working out took away a lot of the positive vibes that fans had towards the company. It it turned, you know, fans of different parts of the company against one another. And, you know, you had the whole, the collision people like the collision show because that's the punk show and the dynamite mm-hmm. show, the dynamite people like the dynamite show because that's the Young Bucks show. And it, it was just a really unhealthy atmosphere, I think, for being a fan. Um, and it was also compounded by what you said, kind of like the corporate identity of the um company which i know brandon thurston always kind of pointed this out which was like the backstage and politicking intrigue and the kind of storylines that were there were more interesting for people than the storylines that were being on television and by not tony khan being very you know mom on details talking about what was going to happen and, and things like that open the door for a lot more speculation, a lot more rumor mongering, a lot more attempts for sides to get their version of things out and in the public. And it just didn't help the company at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Whatever intrigue there was based on like people tuning in to wonder what's going to happen, you know, has been, has been very short term. And I just think overall the perception and and, in vibes, the company were, were really damaged by, just the entire CM Punk experience. And the company is, I don't want to say the company is never going to recover from that, but they're never going to feel the same way uh, after, after, you know, that whole situation has worked its way out. And I think we're seeing that now, even though we're, we're far removed from the, you know, CM Punk's, you know, firing of, of AEW and he's went back to WWE and, you know, he says he's happy there or whatever, like they're out of each other's direct way at the moment. But it just, it, I don't, I think they're going to have to, they're never going to get that kind of honest, um, fresh, uh, like that, like that virgin feeling of, of, of being like this pure, new, fresh wrestling company. I think that's gone with what happened with Punk and you're never going to get that feeling back. So people that are expecting to get that feeling, it's not going to happen. It's It can be great again, but it's going to be in a different way. Mm-hmm. It, that that feel I, I agree that feeling i'll even go further like it's that feeling that that we had in the first couple of years where you felt like it was a team effort right you felt like everyone had, was was banding together and you know the, the locker room was just all you know sunshines and rainbows and you know <laughs> you know campfire songs and bed-ins and whatever you know like everyone was have everyone was pushing towards the same thing you know, uh, which was especially prevalent or or obvious when Brody King, uh, not Brody King, excuse me, uh, Mr. Brody Lee passed away. Uh, when 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 he moved on, like you could still feel like this unity that everyone had, and a lot of people were attracted to that. You know, um, I myself, as an old time, you know, as so- someone who's watched wrestling for a long time let's let, let's put it that way um he uh, you know I, you know i'm very cynical when it comes to uh, to locker rooms where I, at some point i'm like no you know at some point they're all going to try and eat each other alive because that's just the nature of the beast and it's fine you know that's how wrestling goes uh so it was unique to see and a, and a lot of i think a lot of fans were attached to that especially the newer fans which is fine. Don't get me wrong, by the way. It's, uh, you know, I, I. But I think a lot of them were attached to the idea that they felt that the locker room was very united and everyone's working towards one same goal, as opposed to everyone, you know, putting up fences and trying to guard their spots, which is what a usual locker room is. Um, uh, and uh, whether you like it or not, adding a guy like CM Punk. You know, and look, I'm. You know, I was there. I, we, we talked about. It. I was in Chicago when he came back. I, I, I got the hell over there. 
uh, from Canada over to the United Center to see him. So, you know, I'm not trying to, to minimize and go poo-poo. No, I was interested in this. It's a historical moment. It was a big deal when he returned. But are we bringing that outside element into the law in, into your locker room a guy whose personality and and sh backstage shenanigans are very well known uh must have been quite the shock to that nice little ecosystem that they had in e in AEW uh if you know if the locker room hadn't already started to be more wrestling than than buddies and pals and 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 my little ponies <laughs> might be exaggerating a bit here but you get the point um if the locker room had already started going down the the, the regular path of a wrestling locker room cm punk coming in sort of cemented that it, it was like okay it, I, I even before uh the the worker res the workers rights promo and everything that ensued I think that was a that was a turning point. Even though a lot of us had come together, we had high hopes because Phil looked energized. He looked happy, like he looked so free and just uh, um, uh, light. He seemed legitimately happy to be doing this again. That we all sort of, you know, well. Maybe this time it'll go well, you know, but but obviously history proved us wrong on that front. So I think the the identity issue goes back a long time, and I think they're still scrambling to find something. That's why I think we saw that's why when we look back at the past couple of years, like the past year, I should say, where we see a, a more heavy reliance on sports entertainment type um presentations uh you know skits and you know how and, and backstage interviews and uh hidden camera stuff you know the more that we get more and more reliant we got more and more reliant on that then switching back to something more sports present sports based you know the continental classic and a lot of people got excited for that going into revolution we got the big matches they're all just pure straight up wrestling matches and then we move away from that again now we're we're back doing we're back doing angles big big stories and it really does feel like AEW is trying to to find its identity and what's frustrating i think for fans like myself is that it's its identity isn't all that difficult to find. It was there before it was successful. And I think you can easily look how everyone got excited when the continental classic happened. You know, when, 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 when it was something that just popped up that, that arrived and helped us rate, you know, <laughs> get a nice big gasp of fresh air after being clouded by the brochacho stuff for so long. Right it it's identity i think that's what's frustrating i think this is what leads to this you mentioned it right the week to week minutia of breaking down every little thing that we didn't like you know it's like oh she said titan tron you know that that kind of stuff you know <laughs> but yeah but, i mean that's the, that stuff never like bothers me i guess it it bothers some other people but i i, I think of that as like week to week uh kind of little little stuff um but i think that a lot of that discussion about the little stuff and people will argue oh that little stuff builds up and it leads to, to big stuff but i think that the problem like the the issues that AEW has can be identified as just a few key core issues that if they could be resolved could change things i don't think you have to you know, scrub down into every little crevice of the company and make sure that any little thing that they're doing is 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 wrong. Because I think historically wrestling has told us that wrestling companies can be wildly incompetent in many, many different ways. But if they get a few big stuff right, business can boom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, when we talk about the identity of the company, 
um, I think it, it's important to look within the context of pro wrestling history that we're talking about five years now from the creation of the company in 2019 to today in 2024. When we're talking about five years in pro wrestling, that, that used to mean like an eternity. You could take five five year chunks of different wrestling promotions and look at how radically different the product was. You can look at, you know, what was WWF like in 1994 versus what it was like in 1999? What was, you know, Jim Crockett promotions like in 1982? And what was it sure. like in 1987? Um and we could see these really big jumps. And, and I think that in like when people would talk about the WW product being so boring and, and, and uh, generic for years and years and the same people being in the same spots for, for a decade and people would be like, wrestling isn't like this. Wrestling's supposed to move. And whether or not you think, you know, AW is significantly worse off than they were from a product perspective in 2024 than they were in 2019, or even where they were in like 2021, 2022, it's really na the natural state of things for the identity and tone of a company and a product to shift, whether or not shifts in a, a direction that, that is more in your favor or more in the favor of the general population of fans, or maybe it falls into some traps and becomes um, uh, problematic in, in some ways. It, it remains to be seen um, just exactly where that is. But wrestling is supposed to wrestling naturally evolves and no company stays the same for a while. Um, and that's why I think the focus needs to be on how can we create something new here as opposed to how can we go back in time to when people liked our product better, like two years ago? I think okay. that that's the real question you need to ask yourself. Now, I agree with that. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, but th here's, here's the, 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 the caveat that I, that, I, that I'd add to that. Um, if, if your, if your identity is shifting and your your metrics aren't going along with it like it's not doing good you know what I'm, like we know you again you 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 laid it all out at the start of uh, of the show ratings attendance um, right there's tangible business evidence that suggests that the current direction and, of the comp product or the direction the comp product has been going for the last year um is not resonating with the general fans and they are losing interest because of that and one of the basic one of one of wrestling's strengths as a uh, as a form of entertainment is that it gets this immediate feedback and it is it is nimble enough to pivot at any given moment to try and change something right as opposed to if your tv series isn't drawing ratings after episode 6 and you have you you've canned a full season well okay we have to get through the other 6 or 7 episodes left and that's all we can do, right? Whereas if if your wrestling product is not resonating, if you're filling 2,000 seats in a 12,000 seat arena, you could, in a, in a week, shift things around and say, all right, this isn't working. Or this is working, we're going to move this to the top. Or this isn't working, we're, we're going to tone this down and move it around. And don't get me wrong, um, Based on the last two decades of pro wrestling, Tony has been able to pivot faster than whatever Vince has done. Because Vince, Vince's a attitude, for no pun intended, is that he, he, he was that he would continue to force feed. He's got no. You are going to like this. You are going to buy Roman Reigns as a as a top baby yes. face. Late, late guy, stage, you know? late stage, Vince. Late stage that. Vince. And younger Vince was was fairly uh oh, right. observant the, at least enabled. I just to, want to put it on record that Jesse is defending Vince McMahon here. I just want I know, to put I that on record. I'm gonna have to take a shower like immediately after this. <laughs> but like but, I mean the combination was always people would look at like how how consistent he was in trying to get Roman Reigns as a babyface over versus like when he tried to get Lex Luger over and he gave, you know, it was like almost a lesson how stubborn Vince was trying to get Lex Luger over. And then he eventually gave up after like 10 months um, as opposed to Reigns. It was years and years and he, he never really gave up. Exactly. And, 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 and Jal joking aside, you are right. You know, when, when Vince was a promoter as opposed to what he turned into uh, it was a completely different he was a completely different guy and did he was able to smell smell the money so to speak and i think look if the brochacho like ultimately in the span of things the brochacho stuff lasted 
what four months like a little more than a, like than a fiscal quarter and 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 then we decided to move on to something else yeah, that's not bad in the grand scheme of things when you take a step back you know we're going to talk about this the, we talk about the brochachos like it's this dark period you know like this the, the this this long drawn out hole creative hole in 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 AEW but it lasted like 4 months it's it's not so bad in the grand scheme of things and tony maybe belligerently decided to do the continental classic cuz i think he wasn't in, enchanted by the idea i think he was a little frustrated with the reactions of the fan base i think he expressed it in, in that way but nonetheless decided to switch and go and 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 do something completely different right and okay let's do the sports based entertainment let's let, let's do that let's go to revolution let's have sting's retirement and you know do all the other great matches that were on that card as well let's have you know, uh, uh, danielson and zack saber junior you know it's like i it, he has been able to pivot but I guess the question I have is, and we're circling back to the identity question, if your identity at first was a certain expectation and you were drawing crowds, you were having really good, really good ratings, uh, you, were, uh, you were doing very, very strong business overall. And um, it, it, you, you were doing that and you decide to pivot towards something that didn't work and then you pivot back, but then you go back to something that resembles what didn't work. Like, why are we flip-flopping so hard? I guess is the question I'm asking. Why, why? Like, cause it, it's so, not even like trying a little something here and there. It's like full blown bro so, timeless Tony, you know, all of that stuff. So when we're, when we talk about like the MJF Adam Cole storyline, and then uh, you can point to like the young bucks, uh, evil, uh, you know, evil general manager, evil EVPs, evil authority figure storyline. Um, we focus on those because they're like major storylines. They involve, you know, major wrestlers. They might be over the world title or or or, or ma they're headlining major matches and pay-per-views and things like that. Um, but AEW to me is always a very diverse kind of... Um, company which has a lot of different things going on i don't know if the problem is inherently like tony khan being like our new identity of the company is this or our new identity of the company is going to be more sports entertainment more goofy shit i don't think that's how he operates i think that wrestlers in AEW, especially the biggest stars have a lot of autonomy over what they're going to do and that leads to a wide range of different types of storylines and storytelling Brian Danielson's and John Moxley's programs feel look and feel a certain way. I think they look and feel the way that a lot of hardcore AEW fans would like the product to be all the time. People like Chris Jericho and MJF and sometimes the Young Bucks, they, they, they feel a different type of way. Um, and I think that is the key distinction, not necessarily a general philosophy or, or strategy that Tony Khan is implementing. I think it's just because the top stars in AEW have a lot more um, autonomy than they do in other companies, certainly than they do in WWE. And the product is going to reflect what those people want to do. And so you need to, if you wanted to create a firm, strong identity for the company, you need to get everyone on the same page and you have to be nixing a lot of ideas in, in, for stuff. Um and I think that's the key. I don't. I don't necessarily see it as a as a bold, you know, strategic initiative that Tony Khan takes. As much as it is, these are the voices in the room, and everyone focuses on some ex WWE creative people or writers that have popped up in in AEW. But I think it really ultimately comes down to the biggest stars in the company because those are the people that are responsible for uh, their own creative direction or have the most influence on their own creative direction outside of Tony. And I think that's why we get a lot of these distinct different feels for AEW as opposed to maybe a, a more clear cut, uh, general product. Okay. Here's my counter argument to that. Tony is the booker and he is 
he is the guy that ultimately everything gets filtered through, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't mean to absolve Tony from this decision making. I just think it's less of a, a case of him making personal creative decisions and more of him allowing um the wrestlers on his roster to have a lot more creative control over what they're doing in a way that conflicts with maybe the general philosophy that he, other people have about the company and more power to him because i'm sure that there's a lot of wrestlers on that roster who enjoy that their ideas are not like stonewalled or that you have to pitch goofy ideas for them to for for the booker to go like yeah we'll do that pal and that kind of thing i'm sure there's a lot of wrestlers who appreciate that but you know i the the idea of of the idea of this diversity and and, and lots of lots of ideas going on can only be sustainable to a certain point before someone has to because if if you have a booker i'm trying to say too many things at once if you have the booker and 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 his job is to filter everything then ultimately yes he has to have a vision for this you know it, mm -hmm. if if you're a, if you're a director of a movie and the actor, you know, you have the script, you have the actors who have their ideas, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, and getting their input and for 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 how scenes should be done. And you have the, the, the cinematographer who has a way to shoot these things. Ultimately, it's the director who makes these final calls and it should be Tony as well. So Tony inherently should have a vision. And if his vision is hodgepodge, well, I mean, then what you see is what you get, you know, it's like, like ultimately it'll be like, it'll be a, 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 we will continue to have, or at least I will continue to have, but you and I discussions about AEW's identity. If it's a little bit of everything, if you're trying to do a lot of everything and there's no cohesion, there's no through line to what you're doing then yeah, uh, it's just going to be a little scattered all over the place. And then you'll have a show where there'll be interference in every match. There'll be kendo sticks in every three matches. And then you're like, well, don't people talk to each other? Yeah, but Tony, Tony okayed all of this. The, that's, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think I think what we're getting at here in general is the real issues with AEW are almost entirely on the creative end. Um, oh, absolutely. I don't like there. I don't see like AEW has the talent and has the roster to really put on a consistently amazing product. And a lot of companies can't say that. Like I think right now, New Japan doesn't really have the roster to like find its former glory. I think there's a lot of talent development that needs to take place in New Japan. There needs to be better roster utilization, things like that. I, I just don't think the roster is strong enough to be where they were at four or five years ago. I don't have that problem with AEW. The issues with AEW do come down to a creative perspective and a lot of the things that you're talking about. And I think I, I want to get this point across because I did this survey of, of AEW fans and gratefully mm -hmm. got about 1,600 respondents. <laughs> and I asked, you know, what are some things you would like to see AEW could improve upon? How could AEW make you a bigger fan of the product? What are some ways you can see it, uh, them doing that can make them better? And or really one of the consistent ones that was said was not necessarily like I need stories all the time, but consistent stories and progression for wrestlers. And I think that is a real identifiable issue within AEW is that there are tons of talented people in AEW, especially younger, more exciting wrestlers that haven't been on TV a ton. And fans really want to get invested in these people. They really enjoy seeing everyone. This is true in like almost everything. It's especially true in like sports. Like people get excited about young people with potential. Um, they're always the most popular players tend to be on the younger side, um, that are exciting and fans want to see more and more of them. And it's true in pro wrestling as well. When you debut somebody that has potential that the fans start to kind of bubble in excitement about, they want to see more of that person. And AEW has not 
perfected a trajectory for some of these people. They have a really big roster. They have a lot of TV time, but they have a really big roster. And creatively, they don't always have things for everyone. And I think that more than anything is something that Tony Khan needs to get a better grasp on mo moving forward as a product. Because when you have people like Daniel Garcia and Konosuke Takeshita and Ricky Starks, if he ever, you know, is, if he's still with the company or, or whatever's going on there, but these talent that people are starting to really get behind, but they're just not consistently in, in, in strong positions to do so. And getting those people and being able to put them on a, a, a star trajectory with creative plans for them is, I think, what's holding back AW from evolving into a really prominent next stage of its existence. You have your day one stars. You have, you know, Chris Jericho and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega when he comes back. You have your kind of crop of original people you were trying to push up the card like Hangman Page or MJF or some of the or Darby or Orange Cassidy, um, which are kind of your success stories in terms of being able to make individual stars. For five years into the company, who is going to be that next wave of stars? I think like Swerve is, is, go, is there, obviously, because he's a world champion. I think Will Ospreay is, is there in terms of someone that's going to be around for a long time. But you need to get more consistent with moving some new people into these positions and you have to give fans a reason to really care about them. And you could be sitting on the next huge, huge star in pro wrestling, but you got to put that push person in a position to succeed. And I think there's a lot of talented people in AEW that haven't been put in a position to succeed because there's just not a consistent reason for them to be on TV each week and to do meaningful stuff. Um, and I think that's really ultimately what's got to be figured out by AEW if they want to evolve into, again, their next strong phase of the company. I would even say it's a weakness uh, because the guys that you mentioned, you know, uh, Garcia, Starks, uh, they've all had their time in the sun, like, you know, and in, in, in big in big spots. And it's the follow up that completely failed. And that's, of course, that's something that that's something that that's been discussed over and over again and i think you can even you could add willow nightingale to that pile you know i wouldn't call her a failure but i you know i believe that with the with the reactions that she gets you know she's she's not entirely like a 100 percent homegrown but because she she had been she's been doing she's been doing wrestling for a while, but she definitely became a star, a name uh in AEW. And I think Tony has always underestimated how much how how important she she could be to the to the company, not just the women's division, to the company. I think she's super over. The other guy's Orange Cassidy as well. We all thought he was losing up last year last year. And now he's, you know, that when once that was yeah, I mean, done, he was or, to me. I, people mention Orange a lot, and like I get that he probably could have been pushed higher up the card if necessary. But Orange is always in storylines. He's always on television. He's got a match on every pay per view. I don't really see his, his, you know, is he is he ever going to win the world championship? Probably not. But I don't really see his position as much of a of a problem as I do with someone like Garcia or Takeshita. Or any of I these agree. other younger people, and I think like like Willow, who I think you know is was at least in my survey was by far the most popular women uh, wrestler, and is is you know is is a homegrown star to the fan to the, in the eyes of the national audience. Um, you know, was never in WWE before. Um, she is someone that potentially looks you know she it looks like she's going to feud with Chris Statlander. That's good. But she should really be um, pushed every on TV every week, wrestling all the time, having segments all the time, if they want her to reach her potential as a drawing card, which is ultimately where you want these people to be at. Um, 
and it's 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 very competitive to get this time on 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 AEW. It's very competitive to get TV time, get spots on pay per views. is extremely competitive. That's why we see a lot of multi man matches and things like that because they're just trying to get give these people something to do. Um, it, it it's a real challenge, but I think it's ultimately what the company needs to figure out the most. I don't think it's necessarily we need less sports entertainment. We need less of this. We need to have this strong identity for the product. I think that's all important. But I think really what people want to see more than anything is a path forward for people to evolve and take steps up the up the card until they are, if they ha if they continue to get over, you know, the world champion. That's what pro wrestling is really all about. Uh, I think that's what a lot of fans like these days. They like investing in, in wrestlers when they're young and seeing that pay off. And it's difficult when you have this path forward. And I think the big decisions that have to be made um in their risks and they're not popular decisions but you have to phase these older wrestlers that have been on tv and in main events for a long time out of the picture like you could say chris jericho yeah. right you can say chris jericho because that's the person everyone would point to right away um but like i think of someone like john moxley um who look? I love John Moxley. I I think I John Moxley entertains me every week. I think he's a compelling personality. I think he's been arguably the most valuable person in AEW since the company first started. I have nothing bad to say about John Moxley, the wrestler or the performer. But he's been on TV for five years. He's been the top guy for five years or a top guy for five years, and that's a really 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 long time. Uh, within the history of professional wrestling. And in most situations, he would have moved on. In the old days, he would have moved on to another territory or he, he would have jumped back to WWE or he wouldn't, he'd be, he would be gone. And that would create an opportunity for a, a new wrestler to step into that void and take up the John Moxley spot, which is an incredibly valuable spot that one of these younger wrestlers could really deliver on. Um, but we live in this environment where wrestlers you know, you would if you're AEW, you'd never get rid of John Moxley. Like you would, like that's stupid, and it is. It is kind of a stupid idea, and it would be a total risk, and it wouldn't be popular, and it might totally backfire. But historically, that's what's happened in pro wrestling. You know, both oftentimes beloved stars exit the company, and that creates TV time and opportunities for new stars to pop up. And those new stars don't always fill the boots of the old stars that departed, but historically. We've looked at, you know, look at when wrestling has really popped and when wrestling has really boomed and when new stars have been created. It's been because other wrestlers left and they needed to create a new star and they left that opportunity. You can look at WWF, Bret Hart leaves, you know, towards the end of 1997. Shawn Michaels retires early 1998. Um, you know, the year before that, Kevin Nash and, and, and Scott Hall had left. And what happens? It creates a new opportunity for Steve Austin. Creates a new opportunity for The Rock. Creates a new opportunity, you know, for Mick Foley to seize a bigger part of, in the company. And you could point to like kind of any boom period, and that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when if you want to see that trajectory pay off, you're going to have to start looking at some of these older wrestlers and being like, okay, we can't dedicate that much TV time to you every week, even if they're still a draw. Um, sure. And those are the tough decisions you need to make. And, and, and they are difficult. And there's the whole question of loyalty as well. You know, uh, you, you know, let, let, let's say you're, let's say you're, you're Tony and you have to have that, that, that discussion with, with John Moxley, who has always been there for you, who has, you know, uh, set personal things aside for the good of the company, who's always been the, you, you know, uh, in case of fire break glass guy, right? Like he's always been the guy who's turned up and then you have to, you have to try and phase him out. Maybe John Mox is not a good example because I also think he's a guy who understands and loves the business enough to go. Yeah. Okay. If it's my time boss, you know, it's like, okay, I get it. Yeah, you well, know? you can also, and I, I, with Moxley and Danielson, you can phase them down too. And like Jericho, has been phased down. I don't think Jericho is ever going to win the world title again. I'd be kind of surprised if he ever main evented at pay-per-view again. I guess with more pay-per-views each year, it's possible. 
but he's a mid card guy now and has been for 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 a while. Um, but he's still getting a lot of TV time, and he's still you know. I look at this. I look at the company like this. There is a certain class of wrestlers in AEW that have that I would say are like in the top tier class of AW wrestlers in terms of how important they are to the creative of the company and how important they are to the show, which is basically like, are they on every single pay-per-view? And those wrestlers like, you know, when healthy Chris Jericho, John Moxley, MJF, uh, Brian Danielson, Kenny Omega, um, hang and page, like, these are wrestlers that the company is always like, all right, what are they, you know, Tony is, is looking at whatever his booking meetings are. He's like, all right, what are we doing with this person? What are we doing with that person? And there is an elite class of like, you know, with injuries and, 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 and missing time, there's there's some differences there. But it's like, it's like seven or eight guys. Mm-hmm. And then really everyone else is kind of fighting for the scraps, fighting to get that big singles match on a pay-per-view which might only happen once a year fighting to, to get into that multi-man ladder match fighting to just do something. And that's a very difficult place to be, especially as the company continues to add talent and they bring in people like Will Ospreay and Kazushka Okada and Adam Copeland, who you're paying a lot of money. So you have to have them on the show. And obviously all those guys are great performers in their own way. Um, And it's not like they're not worth it, but it just creates this really competitive environment that I think squeezes out, talent that is not seen as valuable to the as valuable yet to the company even though in the long run that could be the most valuable wrestlers of all well i mean this goes to your point that you were making earlier which i which i agree by the by, by the way it's like you know uh, you know that uh it's not a conducive what 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 is the proper conducive environment to elevate new guys right um and you mentioned it, you know, like you said it yourself, right? You know, you, they're looking for TV time. They, they're looking for spots on pay-per-view. Jesse, would would an extra hour of dynamite fix all our woes? Would that ex, you know, it's been discussed, and we, you know, it, it's been discussed in the past. Now that you know that the TV deal discourse is back, uh, it's something that has risen to the surface again would a three-hour dynamite fix the problem or does history just does history exist and remind us that it doesn't fix your problem it just adds more of what you need less of you know yeah i think like like i don't think the amount of TV time AEW has at its disposal is the, is the issue here um, necessarily. I think that it's creative focus. That's the issue. Sure. So if they add that extra hour of dynamite or rampage became two hours or whatever, I don't necessarily think that would be to dr- lead to dramatic improvements. The AEW pay-per-views are already extremely long. It's one of the main criticisms of them. It was certainly one of the main criticisms of double or nothing was the show yeah, was too absolutely. long. So it's, it's, it's not, I think there's a, there's a point where both the fans can only invest in so many storylines at one time, can only invest in so many wrestlers at one specific time. Um, And I think creatively, whether it's Tony Khan or the other people that have creative roles within that company, they can only focus on a certain number of stories each time uh, at, at, at any given time. So I don't know if an extra hour, extra hour would give you some more TV time. Would you, would you be able to get some more matches each week? Absolutely. But it doesn't really solve the long-term issue, which is... That's all, that's, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. No, because because the, the third hour for me, right, takes me back to, to, to Nitro when everyone was really excited about the third hour of Nitro and all of that. And what did it end up just being? Well, it was an extra hour of commentary talking about the NWO. You know, <laughs> you know, you have a cruiserweight match going on and the table's talking about what is Eric Bischoff up to? What is Hulk Hogan going to do? You know, oh, that scumbag, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Randy Savage or whatever. You know, that's all what it ended up being. It's just more, you're just getting more of of what you wanted less in the first place. Um, 
you know, I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I wanted to bring up the third hour because it's often a, a it's all this, uh, this idea of dynamite being longer as a, as a bomb to help um, ease the, the, ease the, 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 the pain of not seeing your Kanosuke Takeshita's, your Daniel Garcia's, your Ricky Starks, your Willow Nightingales every week. Um, they could be in a position for more, they could be in a bigger position for more prominent in in more prominent matches or you could just end up you know or the the creatively what happens is that you end up in the same spiral where it's just you just can you continue giving more of what we're already getting instead of giving actually providing more different directions you're just extending what was already on offer you know what i mean and i I don't I like I'm with you. I don't necessarily think that's the problem. Uh, I remember when dynamites were were just like they ne nothing would ever breathe on the show. Where you'd just be like, you a match would end, ding ding ding, and immediately Excalibur would be like, look, we're going backstage to this thing, and you know, okay, you know, guy basically just had his arm raised in in victory, and we're cutting to to something else. Um, so I, you know. I, I think the pacings of the show are fine. I think it's it that's not that's not the problem. Um I just yet yeah, like maybe this all goes back to what we were saying earlier, you know, when we were we, when we were talking about uh, you know, the decisions, the you know, we we were we were talking about identity and all of that. We're bringing you know, I'm bringing it up again, but you can make, you know, your 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 let's say your under 30 development let's call it that way your you can make your under 30 development part of your identity part of your show it you know it's one of the main criticisms that that we have regarding new japan right now is that you know we have all this crop of new guys but the new guys don't feel important right mm -hmm. because it doesn't feel part of the identity it I'm not saying that this is what AEW is doing. What I'm saying is that it can become part of your of your offer, of your identity, as opposed to, well, what are we doing with Daniel Garcia this week? It's more like, well, what are we doing with the young guys, period? This is what we're doing with the young guys, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you, you've got you've to pick some of these people and really go all the way with them. You can't just be mm -hmm. like, oh, we'll use this person for a three-week program and then move on to someone else you've just you've got to pick and, and they've done that before like they clearly picked picked mjf from the very beginning as a future top guy and they you know very you know methodically brought him along up until that level where they made him the world champion um i, I think and i and i think a lot of AEW's booking issues can be solved really by just a focus on just looking at it's easy to book things in your head. It's easy to, to start a wrestling. Like I said, I shouldn't say it's easy to start a wrestling promotion. It's obviously very difficult, but it's easy when things are first starting and you're kind of setting, laying the tracks down. Um, and everyone, you know, Tony had his first four world champions picked out in his head, knew when he was going to do it, that kind of thing. But we're now five years into the booking process. Tony Khan has spent five years as a booker, which is a very long time in the history of professional wrestling to be in one promotion and be the booker sure. for five years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, burnout takes place, but just the eventually so much stuff happens that you can no you no longer can really have a cohesive master plan like you could when you were first starting out. Um, you look at over the years, what can possibly happen? You have, you know, wrestlers getting injured at inopportune times you have personalities clashing you just have wrestlers who maybe don't get over the way you want them to get over maybe they start getting more of a heel reaction so they have to turn heel when you had them penciled in as a baby face and there's just so much reaction reactive work you have to do to keep everything humming and it's extremely difficult it's much more difficult than when the first year or two when you're laying the tracks and you, there's there's all this opportunity that can be seized by wrestlers i mean it's a great time to because if if Darby Allen came into the company now than when he did in 2019, 
he would be nowhere close to as successful of a wrestler as he would be. Mm -hmm. But when he came in in 2019, there was a real opportunity for a young guy to step in and be pushed as a legitimate future star. Same with Orange Cassidy. Um, same with these other guys. Like if Darby Allen came in now, he would be like used the way like um, I was gonna say like El Hijo del Vikingo, but he's been injured. But you know. Um, I think it's a fair comparison or like a commander yeah. or yeah, like a guy they can throw out there and have some exciting matches, but is is not going to be put in singles programs really, is not going to be getting a lot of pay-per-view time. Um because yeah. the company has it's just such a more complicated and competitive space. And that's not necessarily a good thing for moving these young wrestlers along. And it's harder to it just it's a lot harder to do the creative booking. I mean God forbid Tony Khan gets asked any questions like these, because I do feel like he would open up about, you know, what are the major challenges between when he first started and what they're doing now and kind of how you try to focus on elevating wrestlers while dealing with all these other things that are going on. And I feel like, because I do feel like he'd be open to answering those questions, but I agree. he never really gets asked them. Um, but and I'd be fascinated to know from him, like how that perspective has changed from when the company first started to where it was five years ago. And, I think a lot of these criticisms about the tone of the product and the identity of the product and kind of where things are going um, can be attributed to just this. It just becomes a bloated, unwieldy mess and being able to navigate that mess and being able to get that clear, creative vision done is very, very, very difficult. Um, and it's never going to be done in a way that satisfies everyone, especially in a company like AEW, where I think everyone kind of has their own imagined version of what the company should be like. Which again, however, should fall onto one guy, you know, despite all the different visions, it has to be one guy's vision. Well, I'm talking about the visions that but, fans have, which oh, is like, oh, I oh think, yes. Well, then, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, yeah, not, not just the wrestlers, thing. but I think that's like with this idea, like AW more than any other wrestling, major wrestling promotion, because it's not an institution like WWE or New Japan or All Japan or the NWA or whatever, you know, when AW, because as it was a, as a major startup wrestling promotion, people projected a lot of what they thought was missing in pro wrestling onto that company. And well, to be Part fair, <laughs> they also projected themselves into saying yes, which was we're smart going to fill the hole. Yes, which was smart. absolutely. So I'm not I'm not blaming fans for this, but I'm just saying and, and nowadays it, it becomes I think it becomes harder to satisfy the fan base because I think everyone has their own individual expectations based on kind of their own personal pro wrestling preferences as opposed to a company like wwe a company like new japan pro wrestling where when they do things even if you don't like them it kind of falls back on well this is wwe this is kind of what they always do this is new japan this is kind of how they always do but in aw you get these really um kind of funny in a way like really contrasting viewpoints from fans about what the product should be in a way that you don't see in really other wrestling promotions i don't think people really like to use new japan as an example like people really just fight about like you have one people that say like new japan should be this type of wrestling and then you have people that be like no i love new japan but it should really be this completely different type of wrestling but you do get that in aw where you have fans that are like has to be super sports based, you know, sh almost like borderline shoot style pro wrestling. Take everything super duper seriously. And there's other people that are like, no, it's got to be fun. And it's got to be, you know, with these fun personalities and, and, and that kind of thing. And you do get AW because it's kind of a, it's a big umbrella. It has a lot of different fans that are desperate for types of pro wrestling that haven't always been there uh, on the mainstream American wrestling circuit. Uh, and I think that creates a challenge, a, a unique challenge that the company faces. Um, but in to kind of get back to my point about that is when you have that kind of dynamic, it does become difficult when you compound that with like trying to keep a creative hold on the company five years in where every, you know, the roots and tentacles uh, of everything are, are all over the place. And it's trying to clean that up and organize it. I, I really think that this is implausible because of the way the finances work. Um, but like, 
I imagine if AEW just went away for like three months, like they had an off season where they just didn't produce any product whatsoever. Um, mm -hmm. And then came back like where the hype would be, how, how much of a clean slate you could kind of wipe things off like a real off season. Yeah. And I know people have talked about that. Like wrestling doesn't have an off season. How could that benefit pro wrestling? And, and there's many ways that it could. Um, and it's very unrealistic for this to happen, but I do think that would like hypothetically benefit the promotion tremendously in the long run, just being able to have that period where fans can, can men fans can mentally take a break from freaking out. Uh, and we can get away from like the day-to-day -day granular minutia discussion uh, around the company, but it can also provide like, all right, we're going to start from ground zero again, because that's sure. such an easier place to to, to, mo to to work creatively than it is to just constantly keep things going and, and feed the beast. I agree. Do we think that, um, do, I, I know, I know we have to wrap up soon and, I'm, and I'm, you know, uh, maybe this will be a discussion for another time too, because I think there's a lot of elements to it, but yeah, we're okay. We're that, okay for now. Okay. The, are, are, are we... How much, how much do we feel that, how much do we feel that people are feeling the way they feel about AEW these days is related to WWE getting hot again? You know, if, if AEW was at its, what uh, started off strong and had some great years because WWE creatively and in-ring wise was under delivering. Um, now that it's in a really good spot, you know, and is doing tremendous business, how many fans expect that now? Expect the magic sauce, that special sauce from WWE to to come over to AEW? Because, you know, not unlike what you said, North American fans right now are kind of all over the place where they like, I want my AEW to be more sports. I want my, I want my AEW to have more wacky characters and stories, you know? So, yeah. And I think that's the dichotomy of the North American fan who has, who has seen a lot of the, the, the North American fan that has, especially the, the modern one who has, basically only known WWE, right? So you can have people who say, like, I don't want to see more WWE or I want, you know, all I know is WWE. So if you don't do it this way, I don't understand what you're doing kind of thing. It's, it, you know, how, like, how much has WWE success been a problem to the perception of what AEW is doing and how AEW is reacting? Yeah, I mean, there's, I you know I I I think it there's there's a fair argument to say that there's people within the company who who see what's happening at the other on the other side and they're saying oh we need look we need more of that look how good it's working over there right um y yes I think know? this is a I think that's a really good point because I think what what has happened is it's a WWE is WWE success over the last, you know, 18 months or so has been a kind of a re, re uh, reaffirmation of the WWE is the way that people want to see pro wrestling in this country. And that is what has to be successful as opposed to back in 2019, where that since WWE, when WWE was in significant business decline year over year, the perception was what WWE is doing isn't working. Someone has to come along and do things differently to, to, to have a successful product. Um, so that dynamic has completely shifted. Um, so I think that's a really good point that like the WWE success is giving people, whether they're fans or whether they are people within a, the company itself, second thoughts about like, what does a successful pro wrestling company in this country look like? We thought maybe it had to be radically different than WWE, but WWE's product seems to be doing quite well. So maybe we should mimic some of WWE's product. Um, I think like a, a lot of this, when we talk about like the, like the business metrics going down, attendance and ratings, and, and a lot of people will say like, well, yeah, look at what AEW's product has been like. It's, it's under delivering. It's got all this bullshit that I don't like in it. And that's why ratings are down. And, you know, my belief is backed up by these ratings and numbers being down, which um, 
is a, a factual statement. Ratings are down. And if the pro you feel like the product is different, then it's logical to point to the product being the main reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and the things you don't like about the product in particular being the reason you think that uh, business is down. But I tend to, I, I don't know if we can say that that is true for a fact, because I think that AEW's business numbers being down are directly affected by WWE's business numbers being up. I think there's some swing fans that were finding themselves invested in AEW when WWE was at its uh, nadir. But when Paul Levesque took over, and, and to Paul Levesque's credit, the company has largely delivered on things like Cody winning at WrestleMania, like giving, you know, the you know, delivering at least big matches for wrestlers like Sami Zayn and, and, and Jey Uso that were getting over by like giving LA Knight some fodder to, to wrestle Roman Reigns, even though he wasn't really considered a top guy, um, bringing back CM Punk. Like they've, WWE has been delivering on what some of those fans have wanted. And those fans are now back to being regular WWE watchers and fans have a limited amount of time. If you're watching Raw, for three hours on Monday, you're watching SmackDown for two hours on Friday. It's not as much time for AW content. They're not all sickles um, like us. I agree. Yeah. And I think there's a, a percentage of like swing fans that are going to go with that, whichever way they feel, whichever product they feel like is, is better. And awesome. they're probably naturally WWE leaning because they are longtime WWE fans and they kind of picked up AEW as a side hobby. Um, and so I, I think that has like a major, major impact. And it's not necessarily anything like AEW could really do about that people will say well they got to make their product as different as wwe as they possibly can which i agree probably helps in like the macro sense like what should our business model be it's like we're, we're going to challenge your brand we've got to be different we can't be exactly the same um but at the same time it's i think you're never you you, you were kind of lucky to convert some of these wwe fans at first into watching your product and it's it would be very hard to sustain them when they feel like WWE is delivering. What you really just got to hope for is that WWE goes back down again, um, which is possible. Um, anything is possible. is possible. Yeah, like we said, WWE is in a hot was in a hot streak for last year. We're already starting to see, you know, now that the Bloodline storyline is kind of wrapped up. The Rock has has you know it seems like the Rock is going to be back, but he's not around right now. Um, you've kind of concluded the major Cody Rhodes story. Um, you really probably need to start another run with him at some point. We're starting to see, you know, business cool off a little bit for them as well. Um, and, 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 you know, how will that impact AEW as well? If, w, if people are like, WWE is kind of cool enough, maybe I'll switch back to, to AEW. I mean, this happened during the Monday Night Wars. Like we saw, you know, WCW was hot, WWF was bad. WWF got hot and they took some th those fans right back from WCW. Um, that's what happens in pro wrestling. So I think that's a major factor. But I do think you ask a really interesting question in terms of like, does WWE success make people second guess what kind of product AEW should be delivering? I mean, look, I make no bones about it. The WWE product is not one that speaks to me in any way, shape or form. Uh, that, But I can recognize certain things that they the, that they are doing well. Um, and, and I think that on top of it all, what they've success succeeded in doing and there there might just be a theme to the show right here today but they cr they've created an identity to this era it's the paul levesque era paul is ushering in all this this new stuff these new visions little things that wwe fan fans really latch on to the idea that they can call themselves wrestlers and not necessarily sports entertainers anymore all these things end up being significant they might seem silly to people like you and i jesse where where i myself will sit back and say i'm not going to pat them on the back for doing the bare minimum and mentioning you know new japan flow wrestling on their on, on air it's like no i mean that's good for them but i'm not going to tweet about it with a, a cheering emoji you know it's like or a gif um the but there is an identity to what w wwe is right now you could say it was born out of necessity and i would agree with that 100 where they had to create uh this paul levesque era and brand it stamp it uh you know you know molded in wax you know to make sure that you that you understood that this is a completely different wwe although that's another art that's another topic for another show 
but nonetheless, they were successful in creating this identity, right? And again, that's it's something that that is intangible, but when done right, I think fans, population, you know, the the, the people latch on to it. They latch on to the they latch on to an identity. That's why you know, look, yeah, I work in marketing, and when you do. You, when you do surveys and whatnot and you reach out to 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 people and you ask them uh well if the if the clothing store the gap were a person you know what kind of uh, personality would they have but that's it's these types of questions that you ask but ultimately that's how people develop relationships with with brands with products and that's exactly how it works and they and WWE has been extremely successful in creating an identity around what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I was listening to a podcast recently, and they mentioned something about like marketing and product, which was we're at the point in our society where the quality of a product is is much higher than it's ever been in terms of uh, historically where it would be. If you were to if you buy a hat, we're both wearing hats. If you buy a hat. You assume that the hat is not going to like instantly fall apart. It's not going to give you a rash. It's it's a hat, right? It's it's the, some hats are probably made out of better materials than other hats, but they're all just hat, baseball. Like we're just talking baseball hats. They're all just sure hats. The marketing isn't about the quality of the hat. The marketing is about what kind of person would buy this hat. What kind of person are you if you wear this hat? And that's where a lot of like modern marketing seems to be at like targeting. And you can boil that down to wrestling promotions and we get back to identity. Like what kind of person is an AEW fan? What kind of person is a WWE fan? Are there distinct differences between the two? And if you're AEW, how can we send this message that you are a fan of our product? Um, exactly. Now, what is being an AEW fan? How does that make you distinct from being a WWE fan? Um, like Tony says, it could be that you are smarter and make more money. Um <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but you don't want to be, I don't think you want to be like antagonistic about it, but you want to say like, what is, when you go to an AEW show, what kind of images are there? And I think there is some stuff that AEW has some advantages with that. AEW's product is not as nearly as kid friendly as WWE's product. It's a lot more mature in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that is really the key difference maker that they should be hammering home more than anything. Um, when we talk about differences between the company, like the idea that WWE is a company for children, AEW is a company for adults, um, is probably the biggest distinction maker that I would make if I was AEW. I, I agree. And, you know, it goes along the philosophy of the challenger brand, right? And I'd even mm -hmm. take it a far, a, a, a step, a step further, you know, the, with the Pepsi analogy that Tony uses quite a bit. Coca-Cola and Pepsi, sure, you know, that's fine, but they're both colas, right? And the differences yeah. between Pepsi and Coke are there, but, you know, will you really turn down, uh, will you really turn down a Pepsi if you go to the restaurant and say, oh, we don't have Coke? You ask for Coke and they give you a Pepsi. Will you really turn it down? Ah, uh, well, okay, you know. What kind of soda, are you a Coke or a Pepsi person? Or... I, I, I'm... Uh, admittedly more of a Coca-Cola guy, but I've got Pepsi in the fridge right now because it was right. on sale. I have a friend who's like a, a real look, a Coke loyalist and he'll, uh... and, 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 and I know, and look, trust me, you know, I know people from the South, you know, they don't even talk to them about Pepsi. Right. But I think when it comes to the, when it comes to the, the, the challenger brand idea here, I, I kind of would like Tony to, perceive himself maybe more like as a root beer to Coca-Cola, right? Where you're like, yeah, uh, but I will offer you something that is of a completely different taste. You know, it'll be familiar. It'll be soda. It'll be what you're expecting to a degree, but you're going to come here and you'll be like, oh, isn't this interesting? This is completely new or an orange crush, whatever, whatever floats your boat, you know, as far as uh, as completely as non-cola products go, Sprite Seven Up, which was the un-cola for years, uh, it right. could this be. Is, it, say, we could is, go down that path. This well, this is similar to like what Brandon Thurston would say about 
Um, Coke and Pepsi like are like the obvious like two big brands fighting with each other, or Marvel and DC, um, McDonald's and Burger King. And I one thing I always say about that is though those companies are relatively on equal institutional footing. They've all sure. been around for decades. Some of them have been around longer than others. Some of them are, are more financially successful than the others. But they're both just massive, gigantic uh, institutions in their field, as opposed to AW is trying to uproot and compete with the massive institutional field, uh, giant in its field, which is WWE. And I think like what Brandon, Brandon has argued, which is like AEW's approach shouldn't be like if you're if it shouldn't be Burger King versus McDonald's, it should be McDonald's versus like five guys or McDonald's mm -hmm. versus Chipotle, which is a product, you know, you don't have childhood memories growing up and eating this food. Um, it's not they're not nearly as ubiquitous as the other brands, but we're be we're a better, superior product. It might cost a little bit more, but it's a, a, a more mature, higher thought about quality of a product and we're never going to sell as many burgers as mcdonald's but the burgers that we are going to sell are going to be beloved and viewed as a higher quality than at mcdonald's and that is a that is where AEW needs is, is needs to be and it, it doesn't have to be um necessarily radically different but the approach should be we're not going to try to be like almost the exact same thing we're going to try to be different and we're never going to be able to compete with them financially we're never going to try to be as big as them but we can be better than them. And I think that's that's the, 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 the bigger strength for it. Makes a lot of sense to me. Warren, do you have anything else um, you need to add tonight? Oh, we have added we have added so much to this fantastic hoagie that is the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast today. I don't, it would be, uh, it would be uh, 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 exaggerating to just add more onto this. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug? Oh, yes. The Mr. Warren Hayes show. How about that? It's uh, it's my own podcast where I discuss uh, basically the week in wrestling, essentially. And I also do a weekly Dynamite review as well. So if you're into that, I would love to have you over. You can follow me over on YouTube at youtube.com slash Mr. Warren Hayes, or just look for the Mr. Warren Hayes show on wherever you enjoy listening to uh, to your podcasts and uh i'm also on blue sky because twitter stinks you can follow me on blue sky at mr warren hayes and dot b sky dot whatever anyway i'm there how, how uh, is the wrestling scene on blue sky it's nice you know what just yesterday i had a i had a a discussion with dissenting opinions and believe it or not jesse no one was calling themselves well, no one was being called names uh no one was being called a drone or a freakazoid or a vincel or whatever no one was accusing me of being paid off uh, uh no one was telling me you're saying this because rents do or anything like that no it was it was actually a very <laughs> it was a very nice conversation with uh with the uh, dissenting opinions and people being um you know just chill about uh, about stuff as opposed to you know wanting to tear the house down no it's uh it's very good it's i, I it's improving i wouldn't say it's at its peak yet but uh it's improving the rent stew one is pretty funny like it is really funny or just it's, like a, like i got that one on 14 Twitter, year like, some 14 year old telling you rent stew <laughs> Rents do, dude. I'm posting on Twitter. What are you talking about? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Warren, for for joining the show. I, I want to um thank you as always as a guest. You are moving up the Canadian power rankings. I, I may reveal them. Uh, I need a Patreon page so I can reveal them behind a paywall. Um, but I want to thank pay for Warren that for being quite honestly. Yes, I want to thank Warren for being on the show. I want to thank all the listeners. We've gotten some a lot of attention for this show. Uh, business is going up. You want to know whose show has an identity sees business going up this show. Um, as we discussed at the top of the show, what the identity is supposed to be. It's all in the name. So I want to thank everyone uh, and uh, everyone have a good week and I'll talk to you again after a while. <laughs>